use all the data available to understand where you should put your precious dollars in terms of inventory. Like what should you have on the shelves? I think use the data that you have, all that information you generate, all that work you have to do with metric to see what's going through your system should help you glean some real insights so that you can make the best decisions and be really profitable, hopefully. Welcome to the Kaya Cast, the podcast for cannabis businesses looking to launch, grow, and scale their operations. Each week, we bring you interviews with industry experts and successful retailers, plus practical tips and strategies to help you succeed in the fast-growing cannabis industry. Welcome to the KayaCast podcast. I'm your host, Tom Mulhern, and I'm really excited for today's conversation with Ed Keating. Ed Keating is the co-founder of Cannabis Media, and if you are in the cannabis B2B software industry, you will know Cannabis Media because they are the go-to source for cannabis data. They really are this warehouse of data. They have dashboards. They have an email marketing CRM tool. They really offer everything you need to get a grasp on the cannabis industry. And so in my conversation with Ed, we dive into a lot of the reasons that cannabis businesses are in violation of compliance issues. We talk about the importance of leveraging data to grow your business, grow and scale your business. There's so much data out there. And if you're able to harness that data, you will be able to grow your business. We talk about how he built Cannabis Media and the partnership he has with his other co-founder and how that kind of jives to create the company they have today. And they really are the data warehouse for the cannabis industry. I hope you enjoy this conversation with Ed Keating, co-founder of Cannabis Media. Ed Keating is a co-founder of Cannabis Media and oversees the company's data research and government relations efforts. He has spent his career working and advising information companies in the compliance space. Ed has managed product marketing and sales while overseeing complex multi-jurisdictional product lines in the securities, corporate, UCC, safety, environmental, and human resource markets. At Cannabis Media, Ed enjoys the challenge of working with regulators across the globe as he and his team gather corporate, financial, and license information to track the people, products, and businesses in the cannabis economy. Ed graduated from Hamilton College and received his MBA from the Kellogg School at Northwestern University. Ed, it is amazing to have you here on the podcast, and I'm just thrilled to have this conversation with you. Thanks very much. I'm excited to be here. Let's start off. Tell me a bit about your background and how did you get involved in cannabis? I started working in sort of the information publishing industry right out of college, working for a Fortune 500 publisher that was in the tax and regulatory space. And I kind of never left. I've always worked in companies that track regulated markets, you know, not unlike cannabis. So tax, securities law, nerdy things like uniform commercial code, as well as HR and environmental. So I've always worked in those roles, usually in a product management type role or running those teams to figure out what kind of opportunities there are. For our clients, they tended to be professionals, like on the B2B side. So we would build tools, books, products to really help people comply with all those rules and regulations. And then in terms of getting into cannabis, back in about 2015, I remember coming home from work and hearing on the radio, some state, I think it was Florida, was going to vote on medical marijuana. And then the reporter said something that stuck with me. Every state has their own rules and regulations. And as a guy who was a publisher, that is wonderful because it means there's complexity. It means it's hard to comply. And therefore, it means there's an opportunity. So about 10 months later, I was on the wrong side of a corporate reorg. Uh, my co-founder and I had been talking about cannabis for a while. And it's like, time to start. I've got free time on my hands. And, uh, and we dove in and that was like June, 2015. And working in cannabis, like what is one of the things that's really surprised you? Because there's, from the outside, I still remember when cannabis was legalized up here in Canada. And, and it was this huge media frenzy. And what is it going to be like? And 
So now that we're both in it, what's something that's really surprised you about working in this industry? It's not surprisingly how normal it is. I mean, we were both at MJ Biz. We've been going since 2015. And a lot of the people in the industry are folks just like you and me. You know, people who at the show wear blue blazers and golf shirts and khakis. It's like going to any other kind of trade show. So there's quite a bit of normalcy to to the market where there are buyers and sellers needing to be brought together. So it's kind of a normalcy that, that I've seen. But one of the delights has been how nice the people are in the industry. And, you know, people really do work together. And I think there's sort of that spirit of we're all in this together. Yes, it's federally illegal, you know, south of your border. And that creates all sorts of headaches. So, you know, let, let's do our best to, to get through this as an industry. So I, I've appreciated that because I've not really experienced that in other industries I've been a part of. You have a background with an MBA in marketing. How did that kind of help prepare you to build cannabis media? Like, have you always been in an entrepreneur starting things or did that kind of lay that groundwork for you to be able to build what you've built? I founded cannabis with a co-founder, Larry Schwartz. He's our president and he and I have known each other since 2005. Uh, he was on my board in a past role and we live not too far apart. And he is truly the serial entrepreneur. He's the guy who dropped out of college and started building businesses a long time ago and has continued to do it. So it's great when you come into a partnership with our two backgrounds because He's the guy who's built this stuff, knows all the on the ground tactics and you know how to run a business. And I come in with a sort of a Fortune 500 background and MBA and, and whatnot. So we have very complementary and very different skill sets. One thing that I've used consistently since I was in business school is a type of analysis where you sort of scan the environment to see what's going on. And, and it goes by a, a couple different names. Sometimes it's called a pest analysis. So what's happening on the political front, economic, sociocultural, and technology? And I've always viewed industries through that lens, and I found it's helpful to sort of look at cannabis through those lenses because we could probably do a whole podcast on just those topics. Well, certainly on the uh, sociocultural, hey, things are going great. Economic, not so well. So there's that. And, and then there was other tools, obviously, to do like industry competitive analysis. And that's a lot of the work that we do in cannabis media. So that sort of dovetails really well, at least for me and hopefully for my team too. It's so good when you can partner with someone like that, who is that entrepreneur. I have some friends like that. They're always like, oh, let's start this business. Let's do this. And I'm like, okay, let's, let's make it happen. And I'm more of like the technical guy as well, where I'm like, okay, how would, how would we make this work? It's good to have partnerships like that and really to have different backgrounds and that you bring together. So you and Larry brought your backgrounds and you've built cannabis media. What does it do? Like tell our listeners, what does cannabis media do? The elevator pitch, if you will, is we built a database of every cannabis and hemp license that we can find really globally. And for those licenses, we track a couple things. One, the companies that own them, if we can find that out, the people who manage them, and then of course the licenses. And I think now if you looked at every license that we had, both active and inactive, we probably have, gosh, 180 to 200,000 licenses in, in the space. And Around all that data, we've wrapped a couple things. First and foremost, we did an email marketing system because a couple of years ago, as you may remember, a lot of the email platforms wouldn't take cannabis clients and people were getting kicked off MailChimp and other places. So we essentially built our own to help people reach license holders. In addition, we also built a sales CRM so that users who are trying to, let's say, reach the 11,000 or let's say the 10,000 stores in the US, you know, have a way to figure that out. So it really helps build into that sales and marketing workflow. And then about 18 months ago, we started built out essentially a whole product that is all about business intelligence. So people who aren't using it necessarily for marketing and sales, but are trying to figure out how have license counts changed in certain jurisdictions. What does the data show us about what kind of real estate investment trusts are making investments? Where has the M&A happened? And as you can imagine, it's been quite a tale to tell over the last two years as things have changed greatly. One of the most interesting eye-opening things that I've come across in the last few days is looking at the license counts for stores 
in Oklahoma. Everybody heard, oh, Oklahoma has a license moratorium now. No more licenses, they say, as of August 26th. So I looked at the data and it showed that, you know, throughout the year, the licenses were declining in Oklahoma in terms of issuance. September 1, they jumped up October, November, December. They issued more licenses for stores uh, after September 1 than they had in the first eight months of the year. That's an interesting story. I don't have an answer as to why, unless, you know, if you tried to get in before the deadline and they're still working through the backlog, but that's why the date is kind of interesting. So that's sort of an example of, you know, how we use that data to hopefully come up with some insights and some things that may even be just head scratchers. You guys have a massive database of cannabis licenses and as a data person as well, where do you source that data from? Because I'm a user, I'm a cannabis media user. I go in there and I'm blown away actually by how much you can access the valuable data, especially for B2B companies. Where do you get all this data from? Because I, I, I remember first logging in and saying, where's this coming from? Like a genie, a magical cannabis genie, or, or where do you guys source it from? So what we have learned over the last almost eight years now is that the regulator or the state, if you will, is the best source of truth because that is where the licenses originate and are managed from. And you know, based on my background of all those alphabet agencies you mentioned at the beginning, most licenses are really a transaction between the regulated and the regulator. And it's in both their interests for that information to be accurate and available because the regulator wants to make sure that they know who is you know, involved, let's say, in the cannabis business. And the person who holds a license knows that that is a valuable asset. They don't want to lose it. So we start with whatever the state has. That is our source of truth. We don't go after local licenses that might've been issued by the city of Detroit, let's say, or anything like that. So we begin with that. And then my research team is in to see what information is available and, and how we can supplement that. We then do phone calls into these licenses, trying to gather more data, things that the state doesn't have. For example, what kinds of point of sale software do you use? What types of extraction do you do if you're an extraction company? What kind of lighting do you have if you are you do an indoor grow? Now, we don't always get answers to those. And, and the further you move away from stores, the harder it is to get the data. But we, we do our best to, to gather all that information. And then we supplement it by reaching out to the regulators and asking for more. So that's how we build it out and maintain it. And then we visit, I, I think the number now is probably 150 regulators, at least monthly, to gather data to keep it fresh. So it's not just getting it once, which isn't hard. You can go find it if you're really patient and diligent and dig into one state and find things. But to do it 150 regulators at a time definitely takes some some scale. So there's a big team that that helps us get it done and you know more importantly, keep it up to date. This year for 420, Kaya Push is doing their biggest giveaway yet. One lucky dispensary owner can win one year free of Kaya Push for one dispensary location. But that's not all. We're also offering a second place prize where one dispensary owner can win custom branded dispensary swag for all of their staff at one retail location. You can also get extra entries by listening to the podcast, following us on social media, or booking and attending a demo with us. Enter now at kayapush.com slash 420 giveaway. Now, one of the emails that you guys send that I get every week is all the different license updates. And so the scariest part, even though it doesn't fully affect me, but I see the red, the li- someone that's <laughs> lost a license or got a fine. So how does cannabis media help businesses stay compliant with your license verification and what does that kind of look like? License verification is a fascinating and growing area for us because there are challenges there. There's a high penalty if you're non-compliant. Like in California, back when they were trying to work down the black market, they said, if you're doing business with black market or legacy market company, you're going to get in trouble. So we've worked really hard to get good data from the states that's timely accurate and comprehensive so that our users can use some of the tools we have to check every license. Like if I'm going to work with with Tom's company, does he have a license? Has it expired? You know, is Tom in other states that we should know about? And for some who who are really expansive, uh, especially our banking clients, does Tom have any violations that we should know about? So we work really hard to help people who need to be checking that on a 
almost a transactional basis, like on the banking software side, or just from a general info standpoint, as you see with the emails that come through with the red at the top, it's just an alert. And we include that data and tie it to all the licenses that it affects so that if you're doing research, let's say before a sales call, you can see it there. And some people target that, Tom. They want to see, like if they're in the security business, Maybe they want to find those companies that may be having a hard time doing a good job there and saying, hey, we could we could solve some problems for you. What are some of the main reasons that you see license holders lose compliance or even get fined that they end up at the top of the email in red? What are some of the, the, the overarching reasons that happens? There are many. I think right now we're somewhere close to 6,000 violations. The state that shares the most detail is the state of Washington. They're, they're really hyper detailed. And thinking back to some of those, it typically has things to do with maybe not tracking inventory or leaving doors open to let people in, serving minors. So we've just started to include from the state of Oregon, where they do sting operations, where they send in young people to try and buy cannabis. And they'll say, we went into 20 stores in this county, three sold cannabis to minors. Here are the three. So we're gathering that data now, I think on a monthly basis and sharing that as a violation. I don't know if there's a fine that's involved there, but it's still somebody who's perhaps not doing the best practices. So you know that is sort of a, a straightforward reason why people may lose. In other states, it varies. A lot of times it can actually come down to advertising and marketing violations. In Florida, I remember reading through a whole pile of data we got a few years ago, and it was competitors ratting each other out. Hey, TrueLeaf was at a trade show, and they were outside with a table, and this is what they were doing, and you weren't supposed to do that. Or somebody had a sign that's too big that, that shared things that MedMen wasn't supposed to do. So those were a couple of the, the run-of-the-mill ones, I would say. What's the craziest violation that you've seen? Like the, the, the dumbest thing that someone's done to either lose their license or get a fine. I've, I've got two examples. One is an MSO that essentially bragged to their investor relations audience that, hey, we have X licenses in this state. Some we own and some that we're, we manage entirely through a management agreement. And the regulator's like, what are you doing? The limit is five, you can't have 10. And so they got like a $300,000 fine. So, and a couple people that happened to, but the state's caught on for one. The other one, and I just came across this and we put it in within the last 30 days. In the state of Rhode Island, a license holder got in some trouble. They went up to Massachusetts to a trade show and they won the cup. They won the cannabis cup or whatever it was. Yay, look at us. They took pictures, they put it on Instagram. And the regulator's like, what are you doing? You took Rhode Island cannabis across state lines to Massachusetts to uh, enter into the contest and, and gave us photographic proof that that's what you did. And there were like 25 samples, 25 grams or whatever it was. You know, they were fined like $10,000. Now, maybe the free marketing they got from winning the cup was well worth the $10,000. Maybe there was just a slap on the hand, but it was just kind of astonishing to like be reading through this. And, you know, the state is sort of writing like, what were you guys thinking? So that's one that certainly jumped out at me is that probably was not going to end well for the uh, company that held the license. Are those regulators like, obviously the regulations are different in every state, but how on top of it are the regulators? Are they out there looking for violations? As you've referenced earlier, it's really going to vary by state. How much enforcement dollars budget do they have to keep track of things? And what is really important? For example, a lot of states, and we've all seen this in the news, where some fly-by-night companies are taking popular candy-type packaging, changing a few things, and selling it through. And that's creating a situation where that product is appealing to children. And in most states, you can't put your products out that way at all. In, in many cases, you could do shapes no animals, no plants, nothing that's identifiable. And more and more, we're seeing states focusing on packaging that's not see-through. So I think they're trying to focus on things like that, where there's chance of real harm to people for ingesting. The other area that seems to be of particular concern is cannabis being diverted. Is it going out to a back door? Is it crossing state lines? 
a recent study by Bo Whitney and Whitney Economics showed that there's enough cannabis grown in California, in Oregon, to serve the entire United States. So does that mean that the programs in the other 37 states are essentially superfluous? So I, I think those are the areas where regulators are trying to focus, perhaps a little less so on some of the smaller areas, but you know, every state is their own sovereign nation in a way. So they get to pick and choose what they want to focus on. Looking ahead in the coming years in Canatech, I mean, that's kind of a buzzword or whatever, but cannabis technology, what do you kind of see as the, the future of Canatech in the coming years? I mean, We've evolved as an industry so much, but what do you think is on the horizon? I think we're going to see some consolidation. We're already seeing many companies in the Canatech space shed workers, some of it for real reasons, some of it because, well, everybody else is doing it. Now's a chance for us to cut our expenses. So not everybody's going to survive this shakeout. Dialing back to the report on point of sale, for the last two years, we found close to, I think, 80 point of sale vendors in the US. That's a lot. That's more than we need, probably. The top five control the lion's share, which leaves companies fighting for the scraps of the other 30 to 40%. That's just not sustainable. The other dynamic I think we're going to see is sort of a standard analysis of whether are you a feature a product or a business. I think there's some Canatech companies that, that may fall more into the feature or product, but they could easily be subsumed by somebody who's built a bigger platform because I think cannabis is going to go through the same evolution that other industries have where good tech providers are going to try and own a greater share of your day. They're going to find out, Tom, what were you doing five minutes before the podcast and five minutes after? And they're going to try and build out solutions that help you. Oh, you need help with banking. How do we incorporate banking into our point of sale? How can we own the transaction? How can we just understand better how to save you time, effort, and money so that you're able to do it all in one platform as opposed to, oh, I'm going to use X for this, Y for this, Z for that. And oh, let's not forget about A. That's just hard to manage. And People just need to be more efficient and effective. So I think that's going to happen as somebody who's spent a lot of time digging through the, the cannabis software stack, like looking at all the companies that actually connect to metric, there's like four to 500 now and seeing what they do, you start to see which ones are probably going to stand strong and which ones, you know, might not make it through the downturn we're in right now. That's a natural state of the, of any industry, not just cannabis is this brand new, all these ideas and everything. And it slowly comes to those solutions that really stand out that are making people's lives easier, better, saving them time, saving them money, whatever it is. And if there's five solutions, there can only really be two actual options at the end of the day that people are going to use. So it is exciting to see new ideas coming out there, but it really does show like what you guys can provide and what, what we need to be aware of in this industry as things kind of shape and evolve. What about for cannabis media? What do you see on the horizon? Any exciting new things coming out in this new year? We hope to continue being the database of record for the industry. That's kind of the, the, the term. And that's, you know, when Larry and I started, we realized, you know, there was no database of record when, when we started and we still seem to be it for now. So we're, we're going to keep pushing on that. In terms of some of the areas that we're looking at and, and building upon, we've made a big effort to identify social equity licenses in the U.S. We're working with the Minority Cannabis Business Association to try and be definitive about what fits in that space. It's not as easy as you'd think. Some states are really transparent, like Massachusetts shows what kind of people applied for this license across a variety of, uh, of categories. Other states like Michigan will not share the data saying that well, we, we will not share because those people paid a lesser fee and we don't want to publicize that. So although they said they've issued a lot of licenses. We don't know who they are, but so we think there's a lot to be done there to share that and raise that visibility because it'll be interesting to see over time how many licenses that is, which states are doing a good job, which ones might be giving it lip service. Sort of in, in a related one, and, and this has just been more of a back of the cocktail napkin kind of discussion is I want to look at the data around the legacy market. Because if you go searching in New York City for dispensaries near me, only a couple of them are legit. 
most of them are not. Those companies still have to buy products from B2B vendors. And, you know, is there an opportunity there? I mean, you'll never be timely, comprehensive, and accurate as we are with licensed business. But I think it could help us maybe have some insight as to where those businesses are. But two, going back to your compliance questions from before about, is this a legit license? No. <laughs> so, so we may be able to know because in looking at some of those New York dispensaries, for example, they have everything that we would put into a cannabis media record. There's often an address, phone number, email, other data as well. What is lacking? A license number. And then the last one also ties to things that we touched on is we want to do more with our violations data. We have a lot of it. And as I said, I think probably about 6,000 stories now. And what we haven't done yet is really categorize them sort of to your question. Like, are they for security reasons? Are they for selling to a minor? Are they advertising? There's a general, in looking across states, I think there's like five to 10 reasons why people might get a violation. Well, you know, let's see what we can track because all that data rolls up and, you know, might it be interesting to see which MSO has subsidiaries that are always getting into trouble across the country. I mean, that, that might be useful for, for people to know. We have regulators that use our product too. And for them to have the ability to look across state lines to see what's going on it, it is very valuable. And it, it helps give them insight that you know they'd have to make 39 phone calls to do to try and get that kind of data. So that, that that's another area that we think we can do a, a good job on by working more with regulators. I know you're not a dispensary owner yourself, but you are a co-founder of this amazing organization and a business owner. So what is one tip that you would have for a cannabis business owner to grow their business? I mean, you've seen exponential growth in your company. What's a tip that you would have for them? As Connecticut just opened their doors yesterday on the retail side and warned medical patients, get your product early because there's going to be, there might be stockouts and they put restrictions and limits in from the state level. You can only buy a little, which is kind of smart. I would say, perhaps not surprisingly, use all the data available to understand where you should put your precious dollars in terms of inventory. Like what should you have on the shelves? I think use the data that you have, all that information you generate, all that work you have to do with metric to see what's going through your system should help you glean some real insights so that you can make the best decisions and be really profitable, hopefully. Ed, how do people connect with you and connect with Cannabis Media? I know, like we said, you have a huge resource section. You've got, we didn't even mention it, but you have a podcast as well. Can of curio. So how can people connect with what you guys are doing and find out more about you? The easiest way to reach us is to go to our website, cannabis.media, and that'll have access to the podcast, all the blog posts uh, that we write that are data based. It'll of course have information on the product, how to subscribe or, you know, how to get a demo so that you can see, you know, what it is that you and I've been talking about today. You know, we'll have to continue this conversation maybe on the, on your podcast, we can, we can swap, but it was so great having you on the podcast and I really appreciate you taking this time and I wish you all the best in the coming year with these exciting things you have coming out. And yeah, thanks again, Ed. Excellent, Tom. Thanks so much. Had a great time today. I want to thank Ed again for his insights and really his encouragement for every cannabis business out there to leverage the data that is available to them to grow their business. Whether you're a dispensary, a cultivator, a B2B software company like Kaya Push and Cannabis Media, there is so much data out there that can make you more efficient and better at what you do. Grow your company. You'll be able to scale your company. You know, every single company is looking for ways to do more with less. And there are automations out there, there's data out there, there's tools that we can use in this industry to be more effective. And so, again, I want to thank Ed for just his great, his great thoughts, his great insights, the great conversation. Go check out Canna Curio podcast. It's on all the podcast platforms, same as KayaCast. And he's had some really good conversations. His podcast is actually the first cannabis podcast I ever checked out. I just search for cannabis podcast and found his podcast and there it was. So go check out Cannabis Media and their website. We'll have links to the bio, to their website, to the podcast and everything so you can connect with them. 
I also want to encourage you to subscribe to the KayaCast podcast. We've got a ton of great interviews coming up. And the best way to know what's happening in the industry is to hear the stories of people who have grown their businesses, similar to Ed's story. And so that's what we're bringing you every single week is conversations with cannabis business owners, cannabis business entrepreneurs. And that's why we're here. That's We're here to tell those stories. So subscribe in the podcast app, leave a review. This helps us to kind of grow the recognition around the podcast. And again, thanks for listening to the KayaCast podcast. Thanks for listening to the KayaCast podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show. Don't forget to subscribe to our podcast in your favorite podcast app or visit our website to learn more about our guests and to access the full archive of episodes from the show. Join us next time as we continue to explore the world of cannabis and help you grow, launch, and scale your business.